Okay, so let's move on to the fourth concept. It's again another RFA entitled Investigator Initiated Research on Genetic Counseling Processes and Practice. And Ebony Madden, Program Director in the Division of Genomic Medicine, will give the presentation. Go ahead, Ebony. Thanks, Rudy. Good afternoon. I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues that are listed here. Um, Nicole Lockhart and I are co leads on this initiative. Next slide. So the classical reasons for genetic counseling have been family planning, genetic counseling before you become pregnant to address concerns about factors that might affect your child or your ability to become pregnant, risk assessment, genetic counseling if you or a family member may be at risk for certain diseases or disorders, understanding a phenotype to address concerns if you or a family member are showing signs or symptoms of a disorder that might be genetic, and health management, genetic counseling for adults, which classically included specialty areas such as cardiology, psychiatry, and oncology. Next slide. So we're now in the era of genomic medicine, which puts us in the era of genomic counseling. Genetic test results have moved from single gene tests to include small risk changes for common diseases in pharmacogenetics. So this text complexity has led to ACMG to recommend that genetic experts be made available for patient test result consultation. Yes, based, yet based on employment estimates derived from professional memberships and certification, we have about 4,200 genetic counselors and 1,300 clinical geneticists currently employed in the US. This number is insufficient to meet current and potential future demand. Next slide. A survey done by the National Society of Genetic Counselors shows that most, the most common delivery method reported among genetic counselors is still in person followed by phone, web-based or video, and group counseling. Note that the survey respondents could indicate more than one service delivery model. Therefore, the percentages on this slide add up to more than 100%. As we shift from classic genetic services to more genetic results integrated into the EHR, we will need more efficient strategies for genetic counseling to provide genomic test results. In addition, there is a predicted growth in telehealth post-COVID since CMS is now incentivizing physicians to reduce the load on face-to-face -face care. At the same time, counselors will still need to provide the emotional support patients need as complex genetic information is translated into sometimes difficult healthcare decisions. Next slide. So we are proposing um, this concept, investigating initiated research on genetic counseling processes and practices. The purpose of the concept is to assess, innovate, scale, and or research the implementation of novic, novel genetic counseling practices for genomic medicine. We will support investigator-initiated research on how to optimize the genetic counseling processes. Next slide. Research topics on various approaches to genetic counseling and genomic medicine could include developing and evaluating processes to triage communication of clinical genomes, assessing alternatives to in-person genetic counseling, developing and assessing methods to increase capacity for genetic counseling in underserved areas, evaluating and improving strategies to communicate genomic findings and updating variant reclassifications, understanding needs of patients and stakeholders and the impact of genetic counseling processes on patient outcomes, and evaluating strategies for including genetic counseling processes in clinical research workflows. Next slide. Responsive applications would include research personnel with experience identifying and overcoming challenges in genetic counseling, and projects should be broadly applicable to genomic medicine. Projects setting a specific disease area would need to yield generalizable findings. Next slide. We have current activities in this area. Um, in our existing genomic medicine consortia, we have activities within the working groups that are relevant to genetic counseling practices and program staff will ensure that research efforts are complementary and findings are shared. In addition, the All of Us Research Program recently funded a genetic counseling resource. We had discussions with the All of Us program staff and we are developing this, con as we were developing this concept, and NHGRI and All of Us program staff have agreed to continue to, to discuss opportunities to share common resources or approaches between the two efforts, including holding joint meetings when feasible. NCI also supports some research related to genetic counseling, but its focus is cancer specific. Um, I wanna know that NCI has approval to participate in this initiative, but funding will depend on the outcome of peer review and NCI le leadership approval of the funding plan. Next slide. 
So if approved, we will have three complimentary RFAs, um, R1s up to 500,000 direct costs per year with the project period up to four years, R21s up to 200,000 direct costs per year with a maximum of 400,000 per grant, the project period up to three years. And we will have um, small business innovative research awards, R41s and R43s up to 200,000 direct costs for up to one year. We plan to have two receipt dates to allow a chance for resubmissions. And we're planning for about seven to nine awards across all mechanisms with a total cost across the initiative up to $5 million per year. Next slide. If this is approved, we hope to get the RFAs out as soon as possible and applications will be due in November of 2020. They will be brought back to um, you next May. Uh, we plan to have a second round with applications due in July 2021 with council review in February of 2022. Next slide. We'd like to thank you for your time and um, consideration of this concept. And we're happy to answer any questions or suggestions that you may have. Um, the discussants that we have for the concept are Jeff Bakken, Wendy Chung, and Sharon Kwan. Jeff, do you want to comment or ask questions first? Sure, thanks, Ebony. Um, I'm uh, very supportive of this concept. This is. Uh, probably much overdue and obviously addresses longstanding issues with uh, both the availability of counseling and efficacy and efficiency. So this is, uh, this is terrific. Um, I do think a strength is the focus on counseling and professionals who provide genetic counseling as opposed to genetic counselors per se. And I had to read through the, of course, the whole statement and uh, um, it is clear, I think, with uh, the current draft, but um, uh, I think a little different emphasis within the text might be helpful uh, there. But I think it's a strength, again, that it's uh, addressing all those different professionals that are involved in providing uh, counseling. I think the budget levels are uh, good for some really substantive projects, uh, very much like the notion of having separate lines for R01s and R21s. Um, I think a lot of the proposals coming in in this vein may well be the type that won't have pilot data and um, may be uh, smaller uh, in scale. Uh, I think my only uh, substantive comments have to do with the examples uh, offered um, and a lot of good examples there. I think there's a significant emphasis on uh, communication strategies in different contexts as you might uh, anticipate. <clears throat> I think there's a couple other domains that I'd be interested in. I think are should be within the scope, uh, or I hope are within the scope of this. And, and one is really the economic models for funding counseling, uh, issues around licensing, issues around billing, uh, I think are probably critical for um, making sure these services are provided in an appropriate way. Uh, Second thing is, uh, as I understand from our genetic counseling program or our state that uh, the majority of genetic counselors uh, as professionals are being uh, employed by industry. So I think that's a particularly interesting model from a variety of uh, perspectives. And it might be uh, interesting to at least have a note in there that there would be uh, a welcome of proposals that sort of looked at that domain of uh, counseling services. Uh, and then lastly, I think there's a real opportunity to uh, foster work on uh, all of the ethical, legal, and social issues that are part of uh, counseling. Uh, they really address a, a lot of very complicated ethical issues. Uh, and so sort of highlight that as part of uh, examples of the types of projects that could be funded through uh, this mechanism, I think, uh, from my perspective, would be welcome. So thanks again. Thank you, Jeff. Those are great suggestions. Wendy? Yep, so I agree with everything that Jeff said and I'll just underscore a couple things. Um, so I think within the era of COVID, I think certainly many of us have learned to do things in different ways and that's going to do well in terms of this RFA. I think people are creative and starting to think about these solutions as well. But I just wanna underscore what Jeff said, which is that one of the blockers for some of the solutions that probably are effective are the licensing issues and being able to figure that out. Um, it's good that there will be a grant as an opportunity, which won't have to deal with some of the reimbursement issues, but some of the licensing issues are still going to be an issue. Um, I also, 
given that there are going to be many of these grants out there, I think one important thing is going to be assessing how effective um, any of these strategies are. And to the extent that there's the ability to have measures that could be used across studies, so you can compare apples to apples, uh, is a strength and opportunity I think that program staff will have. And uh, it also could apply across some of the other genomic studies, Ignite, Emerge, other things. And so um, hopefully having really robust measures of outcomes, I think is gonna be important to test this. Uh, and then finally, um, just the realize that not, everyone won't be served by one single solution. And just one of the things that's become apparent to me is that individuals um, across the diversity may not have the same access in terms of technology. Distance certainly will be improved by some of the technologies we might use, but there are other folks in terms of their ability to use digital equipment or um, just health literacy in general, where we might develop certain instruments or certain uh, supports that may not work equally well for everyone. So I think it's important as these studies go out to figure out for whom uh, the solutions work and that may not work for everyone and that's okay, but as we're studying effectiveness to figure out for whom they're effective and who they're not. Thank you, Wendy. Great points. And uh, last, Sharon, and anyone else who wants to comment or make suggestions? Yeah, um, I also think it's a, a really important area to support and a little bit following up with Jeff, and we talked a little bit earlier. I do think it's important to consider how to leverage the current genetic counseling and medical geneticists who, are, I'm sorry to say, were left off the description of the RFA, um, currently do counseling and how to leverage that and perhaps take pieces of it to use by other healthcare providers. I don't think we're trying to replace genetic counselors here. I think we're trying to leverage and make the best use of a limited workforce. Um, there is a comment in the three piece that you really want investigators with experience in genetic counseling research. Uh, and that gave me a little hesitation. There are actually a lot of experts in communication who I would love to bring into this field um, and might have great preliminary data in nursing communication, physician communication that might get um, scared off by that description. So I would think about perhaps generalizing that you want for the R01s investigators that have a significant relevant experience, even if it's not directly related to genetic counseling. Because in my experience in our own projects where we brought those people in, they often really provide a substantial expertise that, that we didn't have and really allow us to do, uh, do the research in a better way. Thank you, Sharon. And I think when we considered it, we just wanted to make sure genetic counselors were part of the team and that um, other investigators who are not classical, classical genetic counselors would be able to come in. Other, um, and so we just wanted to make sure that we could compare the existing strategies to some um, novel strategies. And so we wanted to make sure those they had those experts there who understood those existing strategies. Right, and That's maybe it could just be worded that that part of the final RFA could be worded a little differently. Yeah, that's that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Okay, Any I other? have yeah, I have Howard Chang and Jonathan Haynes in the queue. So Howard, go ahead. Sure. So Ebony, thank you for that presentation. I think this is an important topic area, and I'm supportive of it. Uh, I want to react to Jeff's comment about uh, genetic counselors working in the industry. And in fact, I think that perhaps most of the genetic testing in the U.S. now is happening through direct-to-consumer kits. And then there's some limited amount of sort of guidance or genetic counseling happening through industry. And that might be the principal route by which then patients are refer to physician specialists and their own dedicated genetic counselors. So it seems that this is an aspect that working with industry is something that we want to incorporate into this RFA and certainly not exclude. Essentially, you can think of it as this is a massive experiment going on already that different companies do different things to communicate their genetic testing results. We are not benefiting from collecting that information on how people react to it. And so if there's a way to kind of somehow capture that, it seems that would be very valuable. Thank you, Howard. Jonathan. Right, I, I actually have, have two questions. I think that the, the first is just getting a little bit more information of how this coordinates with and is different from the existing activities in like ClinGen and Caesar and Emerge. 
So, and um, I encourage program staff who are part of the um, Caesar, Clinton, and Emerge to speak up. But those activities do have genetic counselors involved and they're reporting back results. This initiative is looking at different strategies and how to make them more efficient now that we are giving back all this information. So I don't think those, even though that's incorporated in those programs as part of the programs, they are not researching those strategies oh, and looking at those different outcomes. That's not quite correct. So we have an aim of ours where we're comparing telemedicine to in-person with our genetic counselors and with the communication expert. Um, they're not the main part of anyone's project. They're definitely pieces of the CSER project. Yeah, thank, thank you for that clarification, Sharon. And, that, and that's the point is we want this done on a broader scale where there, there are pieces of different projects, but we wanted to look at these different strategies on a broader scale. And um, Lucia or Aaron or, or Rob, I don't know if you have any comments on what's going on inside your programs. Yeah, this is Terry. They, they may not be unmuted and able to speak. I, I would agree with what you said, Ebony. Um, and, and Sharon, you're right, there are um, small components within some of our, our consortia, or they may be even a, a little bit larger, but we're, we're trying to do this on a larger scale because we're seeing the value of it in those consortia, so trying to build on that. And this is Lucia. I would add, um, so there are individual Caesar sites that have um, efforts or, or um, kind of little projects within their aims, like Sharon mentioned, but they're not coordinated necessarily across the sites. And I think since CSER was funded in 2017, so there will be likely to be different ideas for, for newer models or innovative models um, that will arise from investigator-initiated ideas as well. So I think the idea is to also um, provide some, um, some funding for those new ideas. Right, so I guess my, my, my point is to both coordinate with some of those activities that are ongoing and leverage them to the extent that they can be you know, leveraged with some ongoing thing. So I think that's, that, that's very good and I am very supportive of this. My second question is very different um, and a bit more logistical. Why are there only two submission dates? Well, we're starting out with two submission dates. We wanna see how this works out. We're open to renewing this effort and continuing if it's a success and it looks like, um, but we're hoping this is a, a jump start and they can always come um, into the parent R1 announcement. But um, if this does seem successful, I think we will talk internally about um, renewing it and having more submission dates if possible. Yeah, and, and I guess that's my point is that if, there's, if this does seem to be successful and there are, there is some there's some good outcomes there that we'd want the opportunity to be able to continue some of those some of those activities. Thank you, Jonathan. Other comments from council? I think Terry had a comment. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I just wanted to point out as well that, that this initial round and the and the second one that allows for, for revision and resubmission um, are really intended to work together. And so the idea is to kind of get them started roughly at the same time and have them meet and, and develop, you know, guidelines and, and uh, best practices for, for the field. Um, so thereafter, we, we may have a more generalized and, and disseminated approach. Okay, if there are no other comments or questions, um, can I have a motion to approve the concept? So moved. The second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone wanting to abstain? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ebony.